Throughout Nebraska, it's easy to see that our Hispanic Latino population is growing rapidly. What are the challenges and opportunities? That discussion today on Speaking of Nebraska. Welcome to our new NET News discussion program, Speaking of Nebraska. I'm Mike Tobias. Each week through early June, we're going to talk about important issues that matter to you and our state. We'll also look at what's happening in state government and share a bit of Nebraska history. Right now, there are about 200,000 Hispanic Latino Nebraskans. That's about 10% of our population, and that percentage is growing faster than any other demographic. David Drews of the UNO Center for Public Affairs Research crunched the census numbers and told us the state's Hispanic population has been growing by about 5,000 a year. So while Hispanics comprised 10% in 2015, the most recent projection, that percentage will jump about 4% every decade. By the year 2050, Hispanics will comprise almost a fourth of Nebraskans. Drews says the main driver for this growth is what he calls natural change relatively high births and few deaths. He says even if migration dropped to zero, the state's Hispanic population will still grow. So let's talk more about this growth and the challenges and opportunities it presents for the state and those who are part of this broad Hispanic Latino community. We're joined by Michelle Suarez, a retired Lincoln Public School principal and teacher who now helps lead the Prosper Lincoln Coalition, and uh, Lazaro Arturo Spindola, who's executive director of the Nebraska Latino American Commission. This is a state commission that links government to the Hispanic Latino community. So thank you both for, for spending some time with us today. Thank you for having us. Um, to start with, because you both have very fascinating backgrounds that, that I think is important to help kind of set the table for this discussion. Talk a little bit about how you got to where you're at today. So we'll start with you. Yeah, well, my pleasure to be here today. Um, I was born and raised in Scottsbluff, Nebraska. The children, or the daughter, excuse me, of uh, migrant farm workers. My grandfather and my father were both migrant farm workers. Uh, worked in the sugar beet fields there. Um, really, it's a story of education spiraling across uh, generations. Uh, my father was in the Korean conflict, got the GI Bill, auto body certification, was able to provide a steady income for his six children and my mother. And, and then we were able to then grow up in this stimulating, nurturing environment. We then were able to go to college. All six of us attended, five graduated, four with master's degrees, one with a doctorate. And really we see the opportunity, both economic, uh, spiritual, and a variety of ways of being able then to come and serve back, uh, serve the community mm -hmm. in, a, in various ways. And Lazaro, yours is very different. Well, yeah, I was born in Cuba. And I grew up in Venezuela. My family moved to Venezuela in 1961. There I became a doctor and a trauma surgeon, which I practiced for 20 years. And then I, with the new Venezuelan government, once more running away from socialism, <laughs> um, I went up to Miami. I was there for a couple of years, and then they were planning on opening a, a Latino-oriented clinic in Columbus, Nebraska. And they asked me to come over and see if I like it. And I came here in 1998. January the 1st, and uh, I like it, <laughs> so I have to stay. And uh, originally I was into public health. I worked for the health department as minority health coordinator, but I was a little frustrated because uh, my work would only impact individuals or the community in the healthcare uh, side. But then they offered me the job at the Latino American Commission where I could do something about uh, education, economic growth, uh, health care, and other issues, like a more holistic approach mm -hmm. to the problems that would affect the Latino community. Mm. So let's start with sort of a, a broad thesis statement. We've ta been talking about this population growth and this rapid increase that we're going to continue to see in the coming decades. Um, what are the sort of challenges? What are the opportunities that each of you see? Well, I certainly see um, opportunities and challenges around education. Um, we know that education can make a big difference in the trajectory of lives of children and families. And so to me, it's about how we invest in all of our, our, our people, which is again, is investing in our future. 
So to the extent that we value all people and invest in all people who are in Nebraska, we're going to have a stronger economy, a stronger foundation on which to build. So challenges around education, challenges around job growth, um, just in basic services in terms of you know, who has health insurance, who doesn't, um, how do we provide for all of our citizens? Because we want, in the end, to have taxpayers, consumers, uh, people who bring vibrancy and richness to our state, which Latino people do. Well, um, yeah, currently there is only about 10% of the Nebraska population who are of Hispanic Latino mm -hmm. ethnicity, but the projections say that we will reach a 20% number. They are the fastest, or we are the fastest growing segment right. of the Nebraska population. If you look at the school uh, enrollment, even though we represent only about 10% of the population, almost 17% of all the students between kindergarten and 12th grade are Hispanic Latino. And this is a population that we continue growing from within, not so much depending on migration anymore because of the high birth rate of the Latino families compared to uh, Caucasian families. And eventually, they are the ones who are going to be, you know, carrying the burden of the state's economic development. So we need to, as Michelle said, we need to educate this population much better. Mm -hmm. And also remember one thing, we tend to remain where our families are. We do not tend to leave the state after we go to college or we graduate. We go back to where the towns where our families are. And this is not the same case for most of the Nebraska youth who either settle in the big cities or leave the state for better paying jobs. Yeah. Let's, let's talk a little bit about education um, as a starting point. You were principal for a number of years at Everett Elementary here in Lincoln, which is about 50% Hispanic uh, yes. in, in student body. Talk about that experience and what we should know from, from that. Well, I think what people don't necessarily know is just the strength that the immigrant population brings to a school. So there was um, a high poverty rate. Uh, which sometimes that our new newly arrived immigrants uh, face, um, but there's just this underlying strength in terms of families, uh, the work ethic, um, the opportunity and ability to, for parents to come to school to learn English, uh, to give back to the community, to mentor one another. Um, of course, uh, a lot of our students, because they were recent immigrants, uh, were learning English, and their parents were learning English, and yet we still had this wonderful community of learners uh, and just tremendous parent engagement, which not everybody would, would predict, perhaps, or understand. Um, but we had mothers coming every day, um, five days a week, to learn English, to learn about the community, uh, to create social connections, and really build resilience amongst each other. Uh, the kids, um, so well behaved. When I think about Latino families, I think about the family values that they bring. Again, the strength, the work ethic, um, the resilience. and so. Our children needed to learn English better because that is kind of the language of economic growth in our in our society. Uh, they were willing to work so hard. Um, you think about the brain and how tired they must have been, but they just kept at it, um, just uh, so well behaved, um, doing their very best, working so hard. And again, not everybody would understand that. Uh, if you don't work in a school uh, with a large immigrant population. So it really was the highlight of my career working there, the highlight um, in terms of what I gained from it. Um, and of course, the reason I was there was in service to the community, but I got more out of it. And I just challenge everyone to get to know um, the immigrant community in your city, in your town, because there's such strength and resilience and such vibrancy in that place. And, and you touched a little bit about the, the value of education. and. and I think in our, when we were talking or communicating ahead of time, you, you made reference to the notion of econo economic mobility through education and the importance of that. And especially when you're talking about a Hispanic population where you have um, a much higher percentage that don't have a high school diploma than the you know, census definition yes. of non-white Hispanics. Yes, when you talk about the Hispanic population, we have to make a difference between those who were here prior to 1990 which are usually multi-generational individuals who have be become fully assimilated by the system. Uh, I don't know how integrated they have become to the system because in my opinion, integration has, depends a lot on acceptance. And I'm not really sure about how far the Latino community has been accepted within Nebraska. And then we have the group that came after 1990, mostly as a result of the development of the meat processing and the meat packing industry. 
uh, who suddenly found itself with a shortage of labor and they were sending buses to the border with Mexico, uh, hiring and inviting people to come over to Nebraska to work in those meatpacking plants. Now, these are individuals who the average education did not exceed eighth grade. Okay. And um, they came and they, they did not speak English, of course. They brought their families who did not speak English either. And then the schools found themselves flooded with this, especially in certain communities, let's say Schuyler, Lexington, uh, Columbus, um, where there were children that did not speak English at all. And everybody seemed to forget that this also happened at the beginning of the 20th century here in Nebraska with all the German speakers and all the Polish speakers. Sure. And then there were no systems in place to provide these individuals with education that would not only be given in their language, but educate them in the English language. In fact, there was a complaint among the, the, the state's uh, Department of Education that parents did not want to get involved in the education of their children. And my commission conducted a focus group with parents in different communities. And what we found out was that there is a communication problem. There is a communication gap between the parents who do not speak English and the schools who do so. Mm. So um, if the only way to get out of this uh, poverty cycle, as you mentioned, is through education, through the achievement of a higher education, then we are basically blocking that pathway by not communicating with the parents and with the children. So how do you resolve that? What do, what do the schools need to do? Well, schools are doing uh, a lot of things to resolve that. Um, in Lincoln Public Schools, we have bilingual liaisons who really connect with the community. They speak the language. Oftentimes, they were recent immigrants themselves. Uh, we also have family literacy programs, uh, family impact programs, uh, which were grant funded initially by the Toyota Corporation, which are now sustainable in several schools in Lincoln. I know Lincoln uh, the best. So we do have parents, we have programs where parents are coming to school every day to learn English. And uh, they, we have a waiting list uh, because parents know how important it is to, to learn English so that they can help their children because that's why they're here, that's what they are invest in is the future of their children, which again is the future of our, our state. You, you were mentioning earlier acceptance uh, of his, you talked about uh, acceptance of, of Latino, right. Latino Hispanic populations. Um, you could take that a step further and talk about discrimination. And so I guess uh, talk a little more about that notion of acceptance, whether why that's a problem in your mind, but also does is there still is there discrimination that exists? What's that look like? How does it exist? Well, first of all, let's look at other immigrant communities. Let's look at the Italians, the Irish, or even the Germans. Um, they slowly became integrated, assimilated by, their, by the new society where they had come to, uh, but they were not fully accepted by members of that society. As time went by, they were fully accepted and then they became fully integrated and now they were more Americans than the Americans who originally uh, um, refused to accept them. Now, in our case, that process is happening slowly like it always does. I mean, as I said before, in, in the beginning of the 20th century to World War I, to bring that uh, integration completely. Um, it will happen, I figure, in one or two or three generations. As for discrimination, why were other immigrant groups not so discriminated as time went by? Because they look very similar to the dominant group. We do not look very similar to the dominant group. Mm. No matter where we go, we can be here for 50 years and we still look different. And that's one of the factors that human beings uh, uh, feel uncomfortable with. I do not, I would not dare to say that there is overt discrimination in Nebraska, mm -hmm. but I do believe that there is some covert discrimination, especially when you talk about a group. When you talk to individuals, they don't really feel superior or they don't feel that they should exclude you. Mm -hmm. But when you get a group and then you bring in rhetoric such as, uh, well, you're taking our jobs away from us, uh, then that's where discrimination begins to, you know, yeah. to happen. What we have mostly right now is uh, prejudice, okay? like preconceived notions about how the Latinos are 
And most people don't realize that Latinos have more in common with them than with anybody. And they have, like Michelle said, very strong family values, very strong work ethics, very strong religious values. I mean... I was struck by a, uh, I listened in on a uh, Latinos in Nebraska forum a couple weeks ago that uh, a number of wide range of issues was being addressed. And I was struck by a comment from Marty Ramirez, who's been a longtime voice for the Hispanic Latino community and who actually I think helped get you to college. That's correct. <laughs> As of when he was working for the University of Nebraska. He said at the very, very beginning of this, he said, we have a history here but now there's uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, and this was in reference to, I think, a lot of things that are happening in, in, in current affairs, I guess. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd also like to just comment a bit about how we uh, prejudge people when we look mm -hmm. at them. So we had parents at um, Everett who worked on effort stories because we know that effort is the way to achieve. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a mother who developed a PowerPoint for to tell her effort story. And she talked about being an accountant and a nurse in Mexico. And no one would know that by looking at her. So I want to comment that on that for a minute. And yes, when you think about um, what's going on currently politically in our um, nation, which certainly affects our state and our city, um, we see that the potential for families being um, impacted greatly, you know, fathers or mothers being deported. Um, and it's really um, an attack, I guess, on families. Um, if a parent is deported and the children are U.S. born citizens, then how does that family maintain its coherency, maintain its uh, structure, maintain its relationship? And so um, that's what makes us uncomfortable. Um, that's, in my opinion, unacceptable. Uh, we should be doing everything we can to invest in the people who we currently have in our state of Nebraska because we need everyone to be successful, to have a successful economy, a su successful future. So I'm very concerned about that. I think a lot of Nebraskans are. I think if we stopped and looked at our own families and said, what would I want for my family, that we would want strength, health, stability, uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about political representation. Um, you know, even in spite of the fact that, that, you know, one out of 10 Nebraskans are Hispanic Latino, there's very few people from that demographic involved in the political process. Um, how does that change? How does that change? How does that change? How do you get more Hispanic Latino involved oh, well, in, in uh, being in public office and such? Yeah. It has a lot to do with uh, lack of information or education about how the system works here in the United States, how the political system works here in the United States. It has a lot to do with the reluctance of Latinos to actually take a step forward. Uh, and that is uh, related also to the constant blocking that the Latinos have suffered when they try to aspire to something higher. How does that change? Well, uh, I have a plan that for the commission to hold a number of um, uh, workshops um, to educate our young people into civic engagement. Because civic engagement is not just, you know, registering to vote or going out to vote or running for office. Civic engagement also means participation in volunteering activities, participation in nonprofit activities, participation in the boards of nonprofits or other uh, state and county offices that uh, require those, that membership. I mean, to become more involved in the factors that affect their communities. I believe uh, and one excellent example is the School Board of Education, mm -hmm. right? Um, I believe that by developing that habit among the Latino population, eventually we will see more of them becoming part of the decision-making process. Remember that as Latinos, we do not volunteer, but we do not deny. And I'm going to give you a little example. There was this football team in a town in, 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 in Nebraska where most of the football players, there came a time when they were Latinos. Now, the moms of the football players used to hold hamburger cells in the, in the games. And they were complaining that the Latino moms were not participating on that. And I asked them, well, have you asked them to do so? I said, well, no, they're supposed to. I said, no. They will never take a step forward and volunteer because they're used to what their governments <laughs> asked them to volunteer for. But if you ask them, you will see what happens. So they went and talked to the Latino moms, and they didn't know that they were expected to do this. Mm -hmm. 
and they turned out in masses to those uh, football games, they were not selling hamburgers. They were selling tacos and, and enchiladas and things like that, but lo and behold, the, the, the income from those sales grew up dramatically. <laughs> we're, we're nearing the end of our time. I want to come back to the initial thing we were talking about, and then I'll throw this to you, Michelle. As we look forward in, to this population growth over the next several decades, what are, the th what are the things that we could be doing to help all of this work better? Mm -hmm. I think that um, seeing all of us uh, as sharing the future is very important. Uh, I think it's important for Latinos to be integrated into the this society in the sense that they um, don't live in a certain area of town, they don't go to a certain school. But I, I want everyone to remember how important it is that the other parts of society also get to know the Latino community because there's, again, this richness and vibrancy uh, to be celebrated and to be honored. Yeah. Great. Michelle Suarez, retired Lincoln Public Schools principal, now working with Prosper Lincoln. Yes. And Arturo, or, uh, Lazaro Arturo Spindola, who's the executive director of the Nebraska Latino American Commission. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Each week we talk about other stories and projects NET News is working on. Two years ago, bird flu killed 50 million chickens and turkeys in Nebraska and 14 other states. Grant Gerlach talked with a Nebraska producer who's confident the industry is now better prepared to keep the disease from spreading. Next week, Bill Kelly will be in York to cover what could be an interesting public meeting about the controversial Keystone XL pipeline. Listen for a preview of the Nebraska Public Service Commission hosted meeting Wednesday morning, then coverage Wednesday afternoon and Thursday morning. You can listen to or read all of our signature stories at netnebraska.org slash news and connect with NET News and our journalists on Facebook and Twitter. State government reporter Fred Knapp's been following a lot of budget discussion this week in unicameral, but first we're going to talk a little bit about a, a, a development in the White Clay case. Yes, the Liquor Control Commission had denied relicensing to the four beer stores in White Clay, but today uh, Lancaster County Judge Andrew Jacobson uh, reversed that. He, he said they were arbitrary, they'd exceeded their authority, uh, there will, uh, so they can stay open and undoubtedly there will be more appeals. Yeah. So let's get back to budget. Um, every two years, the legislature builds Nebraska's budget for the next two years. Hanging over the process this year is a decline in the amount of tax revenue we're getting, and by law, the state has to have a balanced budget. Talk about that. Well, they started off this year with a projected nearly $1 billion shortfall, so they had to close that gap. Uh, the Appropriations Committee met. They made some cuts to the current year and proposed a budget that was balanced for the next two years. And then, just now, the uh, Forecast Board has dropped the forecast of revenues by another $55 million, so they've got to scramble and come up with a way to balance it again. So talk about this current budget package and that received first round approval yesterday. What's the size? What are the general priorities? What are we hearing as, as that debate started this week? It's uh, almost eight, uh, almost nine billion dollars, 8.9 billion. Um, and the debate, uh, interestingly, centered on uh, not on the large chunks, which are things like Medicaid, school aid, uh, that sort of thing, higher education, but rather on roads and uh, uh, whether uh, Planned Parenthood should get any uh, federal Title X family planning money. Um, overall, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee said that he thinks the budget reflects the state priorities. Okay, and we're going to see a little bit of what Appropriations Committee Chair John Stinner had to say. Pay attention to what your priorities are. So we established some priorities, justice reinvestment, corrections, K-12, through property tax relief. We're priorities, and we started to structure that budget. On other subjects, including roads, and at one point, somebody who wanted to spend more money on roads suggested they could get money for that from a Medicaid fund, and not everybody was very happy about that. And that came from a Lincoln senator, so here's some of what Senator Adam Moorfeld's comments from that first day of budget debate. We'll consider taking $15 million out of this Medicaid fund, but we won't consider taking $15 million out of this fund to go and support Medicaid expansion so 90,000 working Nebraskans can have affordable health care. So obviously Moorfeld was against the idea of taking it from ro uh, uh, four roads. He's actually going to try to attach his Medicaid expansion bill to the tax bill that's coming up next week, so we'll see what happens with that. And so this comes back up for debate next week. As it is so far, when you look at this proposal, who are the big winners, who are the losers? 
Well, it's all relative uh, since there's a shortfall, but uh, K through 12 schools have done relatively well. They're getting about a 2% per year increase uh, in state aid. Um, and uh, there's a $75 million addition that looks like it's going to be approved for the Corrections Department Diagnostic and Evaluation Center in Lincoln. On the other hand, the university is lined up for at least a $10 million cut at this point. And if you look at this package and how it lines up with maybe what uh, the governor's office wants to see in terms of budget, how, how close are they in line? Well, they're pretty close. The, there are some differences, though. Uh, the uh, Appropriations Committee recommended more money for the Supreme Court, which oversees probation. That's all part of the effort to reduce prison overcrowding. And uh, on the other hand, they gave corrections uh, fewer new positions than the governor had asked for, reasoning that there are already like 140 vacancies and they ought to fill those before they approve new positions. So you've seen this budget debate play out quite a few times over the years in your coverage of the legislature. Is this a more fractured start to things or is this just sort of the norm? Oh, it's a continuation of the fracturing that's been going on since the very first day of the session. And uh, one sign of that was that in order to get the budget past the first round, they had to actually invoke cloture and that means uh, cut off debate, no more amendments. I liken it to sort of like turning an ex a local bus route into an express bus route. Uh, you get to your destination, but nobody can get on or off, no amendments. And you get a sense that this is going to continue? Uh, it sure seems that way. It, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, they've got to, there's, they've got to make up another $55 million gap, and, and that's going to cause pain that's got to be distributed somehow. So real quick, what are you going to be paying attention to next week in addition to budget? Well, in addition to budget, um, the tax bill will be coming up. Uh, like I said, uh, Senator Morfell is going to try to attach Medicaid expansion to it, and we'll just see what happens. Okay. Thanks, Fred. And remember that during the legislative session, you can catch Fred's state government coverage each afternoon on NET Radio at 545 Central and on our website at netnebraska.org slash news. Well, long ago, it guided travelers. Now it's a symbol of our state. Here's a Nebraska 150 history moment about the Scotts Bluff National Monument. Scotts Bluff National Monument in Gehring, Nebraska was established as a national monument in 1919. Towering above the North Platte River, Scotts Bluff has served as a landmark for Native Americans to emigrants on the Oregon, California, and Mormon trails to travelers of today. We have Dome Rock, which looks like the Capitol Dome, Crown Rock, which is directly across from the museum, and it has a little knob on the top of it, so the name, Sentinel Rock, which guards the pass, Eagle Rock, which we now have a tunnel through that you can drive through, and sometimes immigrants called that sugar loaf. Rich with paleontology and geological history, as well as human history, the bluffs were the first large rock formations along the river where the Great Plains started giving away to the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. That's all for this edition of Speaking of Nebraska. Good night.